Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are connecting from. My name is Barry Slaughter Olson, and I am the VP of Client Success at Kudo, and also a professor of translation and interpreting at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. It is my pleasure today to be the MC for session 11 of Gala Connected 2020. Thank you for joining us. This session is going to focus on, surprise, surprise, technology. And we have three presenters who are going to be looking at different aspects of technology and how they relate to providing spoken language services. So before we get down to that and I introduce our first presenter for the day, I just want to go over some quick housekeeping. Um, just to remind you, you are on mute and you will not have access to your camera. So you'll be listening to this, but you do have a way to interact with all of us. And the easiest way to do that is through the chat if you want to share comments. However, if you have questions for our presenters, please feel free to drop those into the Q&A uh, section. The buttons are found in the lower part, middle part of the screen. And if you will drop those into the Q&A section, I'm going to be monitoring those throughout the presentations and will then be taking those questions and presenting them live uh, to our uh, speakers so that they can answer. And uh, that pretty much does it for our housekeeping for the moment. Uh, we've got three presenters today and I am going to um, introduce our first speaker. Our first presenter is Zalan Megayesi. And Zalan, I've got to get out everything here, I've got his bio in front of me, is um, a chief support engineer at easyling.com and Skawa Innovation Limited. But the interesting thing is, is he's had a very interesting road making his way to his current position where he works with technology and AI. He's been a diplomat, a driver, a translator, and a software developer. He is a graduate of uh, Corvinus University of Budapest. And uh, he did all of that before he decided that he wanted to focus on software development. So the presentation that he's giving today is entitled Lost in Interpretation No More. And he's going to be focusing on some of the AI and how that is going to assist spoken communication across languages now and in the future. So Zalan, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, let me share my screen. So let me say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to the third day of Gala Connected 2020, which we're going to start with a glimpse at the future of interpretation. Now, before we dive into the thick of things, first things first, questions. Like Barry said, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A button in the webinar. Please make a note of it, drop the question in there, and I've set aside time at the end to go through as many as I can. But the idea is by the time we get there, all will be made clear. So we're going to start with a bit of overview to get everyone speaking the same language about the basic concepts used in our research. Let's start with what's closest to us, interpretation. As we all know, interpretation is one of the more challenging tasks in linguistics because it requires constant focus, sustained high performance, and a high degree of empathy. It's not enough to transplant meaning from one language to another. The vocal style also needs to carry over to convey emotions, focus, stresses correctly. This requires the interpreter to be attuned to both languages at the same time, as well as the speaker. Not an easy task. But what if we could make it easier? What if the interpreter only had to focus on the meaning and the style would sort itself? This is where neural networks come into the picture. But what are neural networks? 
Contrary to what marketing material these days would have you believe, neural networks are not some magical nebulous thing. They could be called an attempt to transplant thought processes from a human mind into an algorithm. They were created to solve problems which are not just hard to compute, but hard to characterize, hard to put into an algorithm in the first place. They were first postulated to exist in 1943 and enjoyed great attention before waning in 1963, when computer scientists realized that they do not yet have access to the necessary computing power. They did enjoy a brief resurgence in the 1990s, but the current form of neural networks surfaced in 2012 with the first practical publicly accessible neural network being presented in 2015. Since then, artificial intelligence and neural networks in general have enjoyed explosive growth, powered by advances in processing power and in computational theory. These days, neural networks are all around us in many fields of life, from computer vision and object detection. For instance, the portrait mode in your iPhone SE 2020 and later, or your Google Pixel, they both rely on a neural network to locate the face in the photo and conceptually separate it from the background in order to blur that for artistic effect. Prediction and recommendation systems can also benefit. For instance, the recommended products in Amazon are brought to you by their SageMaker AI engine, learning your interests and buying habits. Or the newsfeed in Google Assistant, which is curated based on your personal interests by a neural network. They can be leveraged to automate decision-making. For example, Gmail's spam filter. Every time you report spam or not spam on an email, you further train a personalized neural network in order to better combat the deluge of advertising bombarding your inbox day by day. And finally, going to a topic at hand, translation and interpretation. Google Translate was the first to transition to a neural machine translation model trained on corpuses of millions upon millions of books to form a web of meaning between words, allowing the model to choose the best translation for each context. Since then, Microsoft and Amazon have followed suit and these days, almost all LSPs maintain some form of AI-powered translation tools. The final concept we're going to discuss in the overview is that of style transfer. The idea here is to take two pieces of content, treat one as the source of material content, the other as the source of style, and create a hybrid from the two, the substance of one in the shape of the other. This was first demonstrated publicly with Google's Deep Dream network. By today's standards, Deep Dream was fairly primitive, but quite striking. Having been trained on photos of thousands of dogs, it transformed every object it could find in the source photo, like this Kitsune statue I photographed in Tokyo, into stylized canines. Since then, style transfer and degenerative networks used to create them have come quite a long way, being able to transform faces into faces, moving figures into moving figures or voices into voices, which is not without its dark sides. We've all heard news of people's credibility being damaged by so-called deepfake videos. And in the August of 2019, 
an insurance company was robbed by a fraud case where a neural network was used to replicate the voice of a high ranking officer instructing employees to transfer money to an outside account. It's common to say software is eating the world. I believe it's not just software in general, but one specific kind, neural networks and artificial intelligence. The ability to offload not only computational, but abstract tasks to a machine will revolutionize all industries across the board and linguistics will be no exception. Now that we're all on the same page, let's take a look at what we use to get where we are in our current research. The basis of our research was the statement that a speaker's vocal characteristics can be quantified and applied to different content. Quite expectedly, we weren't the first ones to attempt this. There have been other forays into the field. Previous attempts generally used what are called aligned corpuses for training, where two speakers say the same sentence at equivalent pitch, tempo, stressing, cadence, etc. While it makes processing easier, since the content is equal, the only difference between the two is the style. This does come at the expense of being much harder to create, requiring tremendous effort and a lot of time for training, which makes it patently unscalable. Our approach, on the other hand, was to prefer the use of non-aligned corpuses, which does make, which do make it easy to collect the necessary training data, but this trade-off comes at the price of increased difficulty during processing. However, there is an added benefit in that the resulting networks are better equipped to handle what's called zero hot conversion that is converting into a previously unseen voice. Why this is such a big thing, we're going to see in a minute. As I said before, and I want to stress this, our requirement was that we do not want to use parallel corpuses in order to ease data collection. We investigated two approaches. First, a more specific type called a generative adversarial network, followed by a more generalized type called autoencoding network. Finally, we are treating audio generation as a completely different, conceptually separate problem. So our networks are not capable intentionally of generating output audio. In broad strokes, the workflow is as follows. On the left, we start with some input audio, a voice, which we then transform into its numerical representation called a spectrogram. This spectrogram is then fed through the neural network, creating another spectrogram, this time representing the hybrid of one voice and another style. This spectrogram is then processed by a separate neural network, a vocoder, which vocalizes it, creating another sample of audio. We're going to drill into the middle step here, which is where the actual transformation takes place. We started our investigation with generative adversarial networks. The idea here is that two networks are locked into a battle against one another. The generator creates a fake sample and a discriminator attempts to classify this as either real or transformed. Simultaneously, the sample is fed backwards through the generator in order to retest its effectiveness. 
This well forces the generator to optimize itself into a form that is best suited to fool the discriminator network, providing the best quality to a transformed audio. The trade-off here is that the network is slower to train and the resulting model is very specific. It's not capable of converting to a previously unseen speaker's voice, only between the pair of voices it was originally trained for. This led us to investigate another type called autoencoding neural networks, where we attempt to recreate the original input. During training, the idea is that we take the speaker's voice and compress it down very heavily with tremendous loss into a small space called the bottleneck. Then we ask the network to expand it back up into the original voice with the understanding that a quantized representation of the style called the embedding is provided to it in both phases. Hopefully, this allows the network to zero in on the content of the, of the voice as it can assume that the style information will be provided. What it allows us to do is to feed it a different style embedding during the actual use, transforming the output into a different voice. Because this embedding is independent of the content, once it's created, it can be used to transform into a previously unseen speaker, not just one that the network was trained for. This is what's called zero hot conversion. The conclusion of our research was that the actual style transfer is but half the challenge. The resulting representation still needs to be vocalized, which is done by a vocoding network, which is where most of our problems seem to lie. Our conclusion here is that these networks are not yet ready for real-time application as they introduce significant noise into the output audio, which is very hard to remove without harming quality. And perhaps more importantly, these networks are currently far too slow for real-time application, vocoding one second of audio in approximately five minutes of real time. Further, they require that all the data be available to them, which makes them unable to vocalize streaming inputs like my voice as I'm talking to you right now. However, advances are being made in this field and I'm expecting these networks to reach production quality and production speed in about three to five years. And finally, because the best way to predict the future is to be the ones who create it, let's take a look at what I expect this future to have in store for us. We've seen the challenges this field poses. Not only do we have to contend with training the networks used, we also need to solve the problem of vocalizing the transformed audio fast enough to be able to transform voices in real time. However, should these problems be cracked, this is shaping up to be the holy grail of interpretation. It will allow any speaker to convey their full meaning via any interpreter at any time thanks to being able to convert to previously unseen voices. This is why zero hot conversion is such an important conclusion for us. And coupling this with existing transcription and neural machine translation technologies, real-time transformation between any pair of languages will become possible allowing each of you listening right now 
to hear my presentation in your own language. If there is one thing you're going to take home from this talk, if there is one thing that's going to stick in your mind, I want it to be this slide. People usually think AI and automation will not affect their job. Sure, it will affect everyone else's, but not theirs. They're wrong. AI may not eat everyone's job, but will most certainly affect it for better or for worse. And it's up to us to make sure that our jobs are being affected for the better. Thank you for your attention. Now let's see the questions that have come in during my talk. Barry? Milan, thank you so much uh, for that extremely interesting presentation, particularly as I was uh, listening, seeing how you have made use of non-parallel corpora to be able to do the training is uh, an interesting and I think novel concept. Um, the first question that has come up actually has to do with the vocalization that you referred to. So mm -hmm. uh, the question is, until the vocalization is actually possible, because as you talk to a lot of um, end users that have used uh, speech to speech or speech to text translation, it's been challenging to listen to the synthesized voice as it is because of the, the elements that you've mentioned in terms of cadence, mm -hmm. in terms of intonation, emphasis, etc. So that is the holy grail. It looks like it's still a ways out. How can practitioners and how can companies leverage the technology to help improve human interpretation? Yes, that's a very good question. I think uh, one of the best ways to leverage this to improve human interpretation would be to employ neural machine translation and transcription technologies to make suggestions in real time to a translator, to the interpreter. Um, turns of uh, speech, figures of speech, phrases that may or may not pop into their mind in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. And that could be extensive to terminology, I would think as well, for a given meeting? Yes, if the network can be trained on term bases, on let's say figures of speech for an individual presenter, then yes, absolutely, it can be used to improve terminology use. Okay, excellent. So uh, next question, and this is a, a, a bit broader in scope. It comes from uh, David Utrilla, and he says, how do we make AI our best friend rather than our enemy? Which is often the way it's perceived by us as we think, is this going to take a job? Yes, I believe that the best way to make AI our friend instead of an opponent is to focus it in places where humans have, where the boring parts lie. You can parallelize decision-making on a massive scale, but when it comes to inspiration, you're not going to automate that way. And you're not going to automate leadership, empathy, the human factor, away anytime soon. So I think the best way to make it our friend is to put it to work in places where, where there is uh, no such need. All right, very good, thank you. Another question that's come in, this is from an anonymous attendee, is as people have different styles of speaking, do you believe these machines will be able to study and match the manner of speech that one uses? Are we already there or do you think that we will be there soon? Yes, um, I think that depends on how we define manner of speech. If it comes down to 
my individual cadence, how I stress word, my individual cadence, the tone of my voice, how I play with the tone of my voice, then I believe that uh, a neural network can already replicate this. If we define manner of speech as my cadence, the choice of my words, where I pose, which words I stress to express uh, focus. No, and I don't think it will be able to match this anytime soon. That's one of the places where the interpreter will be crucial, as they will know which words, which parts of the sentence need to be stressed in the foreign language, or they control the cadence, the tempo, by how fast or how slow they speak. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, we do have uh, about four minutes, and we just had another question come in. This one is from um, Mariana Nagy. It says, you mentioned that you used non-parallel corpora for mm -hmm. training the voice. Would you mm -hmm. say that a similar method could be used for low corpora languages to create machine translation from non-parallel texts? I'm not sure if the two are strictly comparable since we only had to deal with uh, capturing the style information of two voices. I think variations of non-parallel corpus training could be leveraged for uh, text-based neural machine translation, but I believe it's a conceptually different problem, different uh, domain. Yeah. Um, one other question, I think we've, we do have probably uh, time for one more, mm -hmm. is um, what about the long tail languages and those that have limited data available for them? Um, is this technology and, and working with a voice and being able to have the vocalization, is that gonna be dependent and we're going to see that go to the typical languages, Spanish, French, maybe Chinese initially, and the technology isn't going to extend out to the, the longer tail or those languages that don't have as much data available? Yes, I think uh, that will be the case initially. So because most of the corpora are available for English and for these major languages, these are probably going to be the ones who that get the technology first. Yeah. But eventually, as the technology matures and becomes commoditized, so to speak, I do believe we're going to see it extend into the long tail languages like, uh, like Hungarian, like uh, uh, local dialects, uh, small languages, endangered languages, possibly even. Yeah. Understood. Well, great. So, Lan, if you want to go ahead and end your screen share, we'll go ahead and wrap up right on schedule. And uh, um, feel free, folks, in the chat to express your gratitude to Zalan for sharing such an interesting presentation.